I was sleeping in a truck on the back road behind a dirt racetrack in Kentucky, having driven all night from a show in eastern Missouri. The truck was owned by the Joey Chitwood Auto Thrill Show that toured the USA doing stunt driving shows. I was their head mechanic and apprentice stunt driver. Life was good at 19 years old. It all came to an abrupt halt that morning at 7 a.m. when I was awakened by an agent from the U.S. Postal Service. He handed me a registered letter to sign. It was my draft notice. Later that morning, as my world flew into a cyclone, my show buddy said, screw that, go to Canada. I thought, yeah, right, do what all the other anti-war draft dodgers are doing. I called my dad on a payphone to ask for his advice, and as I dialed, I realized I was calling a man who served four years in the Pacific during World War II. His advice was simple and straightforward. You're just going to have to go. I arrived at Fort Benning, Georgia, and as we got off the Army bus at the basic training company, we were met by a huge growling drill sergeant with a quarter inch wide scar from his scalp across his eye, nose, and mouth, and on down to his neck. He roared at us. How many of you shitheads are draftees? Almost every hand went up. Well, that's just too damn bad, you pukes. Here's where it's at. You're all going to the infantry, you're all going to Vietnam, and you're all going to fucking die. Four months later, after extensive infantry training, I was in a 3rd Corps Vietnam Infantry Company, learning fast from the combat vets there who were dropping like flies on a daily basis in an outfit that was at 35% strength due to casualties. In no time at all, I witnessed legs blown off from booby traps, rib cages, and torsos destroyed from small arm fire, and had comrades' blood and guts splattered across my face. I watched the enemy cry and die at our doing, along with their homeland devastated by our artillery, our helicopter gunships, and our B-52 carpet bombing. Remember this, people. We were just kids sent to war. You pull off a night ambush on enemy Viet Cong, killing a dozen of them and thinking, yeah, we kick some motherfucking ass. And then when the sun comes up, you move in for the body count and you see a mother who is crying insanely as she holds her two-year-old who was killed by the exchange of bullets that night. You want to feel like rotten shit for the rest of your life? Combat in Vietnam was a great place to get that ball rolling. You want to feel even more rotten? While you're living in the swamps and muck, your longtime girlfriend, who you had hoped to marry, writes you a letter telling you that she has been concerned with your letters that reflect the war violence and how you seem to be accepting it. Oh, and by the way, she's also been dating a new guy and now she's pregnant. Just what a soldier wants to hear. After eight months of madness... We were blessed with a chaplain who helicoptered out to our rice paddy base camp on a Sunday morning. He held a generic service for any one of us grunts who cared to join him. As he asked us to pray, I extended my own prayer in which I asked God to please let me get my leg blown off. That seemed like the only way I was going to get out of here alive. My good luck was running out, I thought. I'll be happy to get out of here with one leg. Just get me out of this hell. A week later, while on search and destroy mission near the Cambodian border, we made contact with a company of North Vietnamese regulars. It was a shootout to end all shootouts. One of my buddies was hit. His face ripped up, jaw shattered, bleeding profusely. I went to his aid, hopping across the rice paddy dike. And as my left foot leaped onto the dike, an enemy rocket-propelled grenade hit the base of the dike, blowing me high into the air. As I crashed to the rice paddy floor, the pain and numbness immediately shot up to my hip. After screaming, fuck, fuck, my next thought was, I just got my leg blown off. I prayed for it, and now I got it. 
but after the further review from my comrades and our company medic, the explosive concussion left my body parts intact, as my foot had swollen to the size of a football. Hours later, after we had driven the enemy back, I was medevaced out by helicopter. I ended up in the Army Hospital in Okinawa with 23 foot fractures and a dozen shrapnel wounds. To me, God had granted me my wish, but it came in spades. I got a heavenly bonus. Foot and legs still there after a few surgeries, but I am out of Vietnam. When you grow old and all of this madness is well behind, you tend to put it all in perspective. I've come to see it as the fate and luck factor, FLF. The Army had a policy for wounded soldiers. If you were in a recovery hospital for 60 days, you were automatically discharged and sent home. I was in the Okinawa hospital for 59 days. Too bad. So. I was reassigned on a cane to career in order to complete my 18 months of drafted duty. When I got to career, along with a dozen other Vietnam crips on canes and crutches, we were interviewed by a lieutenant. He looked at my records, my medical profile, and asked, so, what do you want to do for four months? I thought and said, well, can I have a job driving a truck? He responded, no, you don't want to do that. You'll be making runs up to the DMZ, and because you have an infantry MOS, they'll make you do bunker duty. In a month, it's going to get colder than hell up there. Didn't sound like a lot of fun. The lieutenant then suggested, how about I assign you to a supply company down the road here? You'll work every other night pulling hot shipping orders. That means you get every other night off and every day off. And right outside the main gate is a village with nothing but bar girls and bars. I considered it for about, ooh, three seconds. Saluted the lieutenant and said, Sir, sign me up. Now here was the FLF working. During those four months in career, I got to hang loose, party, and connect with other Vietnam vets there like myself. It was a time to blow off combat steam and decompress. When I finally was discharged and came home, I had the chance to be more ready to return to the world I had left. I had time to relieve my PTSD potentials, or so it had seemed. When I got home, I must admit, I was a bit shaky. Like on day two, I went to the department store to buy some new hip clothes. I went into the store's restaurant for a cup of coffee, and while sipping it, I looked around, and it seemed like all the shoppers in the place were staring at me as if they know where I'd been and what I'd done. I started shaking, spilling my coffee on the counter. Man, I gotta get out of here. These events are the PTSD ghost. They exist. We just have to accept and get through it. Easy to say, but that's the deal. You kill or be killed for months on end. Your normality must be regained. Was it honorable? Was it for service to country? Just ask those kids who fought it and then ask the politician who supposedly managed it. What the hell was the reason? After being home for a few more days, my dad asked me if I had seen any of my old homies. I had not. But he mentioned, I saw your old buddies, Shaky and Clemens, working at the gas station the other day. They both had long hair and beards. Shaky looked like Jesus. Well, that sounded interesting, so I went to see them both to say hello and check back in. And yes, they were both hippied out. First thing Jesus did was light a joint, hand it to me, and say, Get high for peace, man. The war must be stopped. And what could I say? I could have felt resentment. I I could have agreed. But after being home a while, I began reading up on books by some who had been in the Vietnam involvement in the early days, as far back as 1950. I discovered the Ellsberg Papers, the exposed CIA accounts, and other writings that confirmed that our Vietnam War was America's albatross. 
I was fortunate to get through it and go on with a successful life. But I do grieve when I think about those who were seriously maimed, not to mention the 58,000 plus young soldiers who were killed. And so many who left the war zone and immediately had to return home with no buffer, no cushion, like I was fortunate enough to have in Korea. The fate and luck factor, I suppose. Signed, Rick.